Yani. Okay. Okay, we're live. Boya Locker Room, episode 75. This is our our summer ending almost edition, I guess. Um, it's been a great summer for the Hoyas. Uh, thus, I have donned the bucket cap, um, also to hide my ball spot. Um, we have a we have a, a guest that, as I always say, um, I think this is going to be a great episode. We have a guest I've been looking forward to getting on. Um, I think his work is priceless. Um, I, 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 again, I, I, I can go on and on, but I, I, I want to jump right into the questions. But John Regan, um, I want to thank you for um, um, coming through and visiting the Hoy locker room. And I'm going to give Mark a chance to say a couple words and we'll jump right in. Uh, well, thank you. I mean, that, that's what I would start off by saying, but I, I would also say without, without question that, uh, I think it's very important that uh, you hear that? Yeah, we got you. Can you hear us? Yeah, can you hear me? We hear you fine. You're good. Wait, 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 wait. That, that's 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 not what I was trying to. That's, that's the, producers, the producers are messing up around here. There we go. There we go. There we go. Yeah, that's what I'm talking about. That's what I'm talking about. Happy birthday, Gene Smith. Uh, we don't do the Marilyn Monroe type of thing around here. We do a 50 cent style. And Stevie Wonder, you know, it's his happy birthday, man. Hey, John, that would have been a lot smoother if we would have planned it. <laughs> <laughs> it, it, it. It wasn't supposed to be. It's my plan. It's my plan. Uh, but absolutely great to have you on, John. Uh, and uh, I, let's, let's get right into it. Uh, I am personally curious. Uh, a lot of things we want to talk about, but th this is a pretty thorough for you. For those of you who haven't seen it, this is the book. Uh, we'll get into that, but it's it's extremely thorough. And I'm curious how cooperative John Thompson Jr. was uh, with the project. Uh, we'll answer that momentarily. First, I also want to congratulate this group, Hoya Locker Room, on its 75th episode. You guys do a lot of good work, uh, not only in terms of the, the players you bring back, but the people you bring back that add to the discussion. So I learn something from every, every episode I watch, whether it's a former player, whether it's somebody who's a manager, whether it was Wendy from Soul Hoyas, whatever the case and the guests were, it adds to a discussion. And I hope that you understand that it's, I'm, I'm glad to be here, but I'm also glad this, this, forum continues to grow and to participate and to widen the discussion around both basketball as well as Georgetown as a whole. So let me get to your question, which was um, surprisingly, John did not play a role at all in the book. Um, the book itself was a, a, a multi-year kind of effort that began when I had originally put together the, the Georgetown Basketball History Project website, which dates back to 2003. Uh, I was invited to be on the committee with Hoys Unlimited for the 100th anniversary of men's basketball in 2007. And so some of the work that I had done on that moved into the discussion around the, this, this, the uh, uh, events that happened in 07. And when the book was conceived, it came at a very interesting time where in 2008, Bernard Muir, who was the athletic director, had, an, had the idea behind the book. He was approached by a publishing company who was going to offer a series of books around college basketball. It's going to be 30 different schools at one point. And I was, was asked to, to get behind it, and I certainly was interested in doing so. And about two-thirds of the way through, uh, the publisher kind of hit a timeout and said, we don't have the cash flow to, to put 30 books together. Can you wait? And I said, sure. Uh, and then at that point, Bernard leaves. 
And then there's this 14 months with no athletic director. And so everything was very much in flux, but, uh, and the book launched in 2010. But uh, the basketball office was not as closely tied to this as you might think. I had some contacts with Pat McArdle, with uh, Dan O'Neill, but from, a, from either from Big John or JT3, there was no direct contact with me. They may have contacted through the publisher in terms of the, the items, the, the images that were in the book, but from the content, the text itself, um, there was no direct contact. Well, I, I just want to say, uh, you said surprisingly, I'm not surprised at all. No. <laughs> I, I would have been surprised if you'd said, oh, he opened the doors up. You know, no, there I, are... that, that wasn't his style. I understand that. I'm, I'm sure that something got to his attention. If there was something he had a particular point to, he would have made that point. Um, but I, I, the university was very helpful in terms of putting together the pieces. It was a little bit unnerving for me because I was providing text. I did not see the final product until it, it published. So I never got to see the, the, the publisher's wow. proofs. That's a little scary too. It'd be like, you know, it's just not something That's you would want to have happen. But I literally provided it and all of a sudden they said the book's ready. I'm like, what's it going to look like? So it worked out very well, but that was the style of the author, of the publishers because of their publishing schedule. So I did never saw a proof until the final copies wow. arrived in the, in the post office. Heard of that. Yeah. So, so, John, so, John, let me go backwards. I don't mean to cut you off, Markham, but I do. Let me, let me go backwards. So do I have it correct? You were class of 84? Yes. Okay, so I have that correct. So while you were at Georgetown, what was the Georgetown, what was the Hilltop experience like for you? What was the Georgetown experience like for you? Because what I'm trying to go is mm -hmm. how, how did this come about that you would be in charge of what I, what I think are valuable assets to the university. And even more importantly, you're sharing those assets in a way that it will live on, you know, it, until the next person picks up the mm -hmm. ball, which again, it, it, I think what, what you're doing represents a lot of what Georgetown's all about. Do it yourself. Yeah. Like you can't sit around and wait for somebody else to do it, but just want to kind of go back to when you were on the hilltop and the relationship, maybe you formed with the athletic department or the program. What is the, What's the driving force for you? With this? Yeah, I arrived in the fall of 1980, a first gen kid from uh, Dallas, uh, as the accent might suggest. Um, <laughs> and I spent my first two years at Georgetown as sports editor of the Hoya. Okay. So I had views to the athletic department. I, I met Frank Rienzo and Joe Lang in the first couple of weeks I was there. I went to basketball games. I went to baseball games, whatever the case may be. And so I, I picked up an interest in the sports side of, of Georgetown athletics uh, at, a, at a relatively early age. I went to all the Big East tournaments. I'd go to road games as allowed. Um, and by the time I graduated, um, I was interested in kind of the statistical side of how Georgetown's basketball team had grown over the years. Uh, picked up a couple of press guides, started seeing, you know, kind of the connections in terms of who these people were before me. Who was John Duran? Who was Merlin Wilson? Who was these people in black and white photos in the back of the, of the uh, press guide? And so that grew in in terms of my interest in thinking of the program in a totality and while the the 72 and on was very very important john could not john thompson could not get to 72 without a history beforehand um i've been involved in other activities at the university through the alumni board of governors and through hoys unlimited so i've had connections within the university i think the ability to take that into the online environment is where it really took hold um, in addition to the history project. I'm involved in a project called HoyaSaxa.com, which started in 96, 97. And it brought a lot of people in from a community standpoint into the discussion. Uh, none of this would have been possible without the internet and social media, but I had the interest from an early age, from an early undergraduate age, as to how this all connected. So to your point, uh, sport, following sports, following Georgetown uh, was a busy part of my four years um, regardless of being an accounting major at the time. So you're responsible for that blasphemous article, Gino in the NBA, question mark. <laughs> I, I don't think I wrote it, but I may have been aware of it. So, uh... <laughs> oh, I, I want to know about this. Blasphemous. I want to know about this. But let, 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 let's keep going backwards. I, I'm, I'm, I made a mistake. Uh, we always ask people uh how they ended up at Georgetown. Why didn't you end up at Penn or Howard or Morehouse? <laughs> well, here's the, here's, the, here's the story behind this. And this is a couple of phrases will come up that Gene may be familiar with from that era. 
Um, it's, it's the fall of 1979. I'm looking at schools. I don't really have a, a strong opinion on any of them, but a friend of a friend went to my parents and said, hey, we've got a son who's a senior at Georgetown University. If you can find a way to come up one day, you can visit the school and have an interview there because at the time, interviews were done on campus. So it turns out somewhere in November of 79 that Eastern Airlines, a name from the past, had a sale for $79 round trip from Dallas to Washington. Wow. And this worked out. So I, I flew up on a Sunday. It was 60 degrees. The leaves are falling. The, the young co-eds are wearing the sweaters. It's very collegial. Uh, I had a, a senior, he met me, went to, to uh, dinner at the tombs, went to Freeze's Breeze, finished out back at the tombs that evening. Uh, Monday morning was a, a tour of the campus interview uh, at White Gravener and a lunch at New South of all places oh. and thought, this is a really nice place. This, I, had I not visited, I probably, my awareness of Georgetown would have been very limited, but that's how I got there. Uh, and um, it worked out very well for me. I wasn't, the, I wasn't the top student in my high school by any stretch. And I really wasn't looking at Ivy League schools, but I thought Georgetown was a, was a uh, unique combination of what it could offer and being somewhere distinctly different from where I was. So uh, it was a good experience. And that, that, um, that, that airplane offer made a big difference. I, I, what I, other I, schools did you consider? I, I, I looked at Boston College and I, I had gone on a uh, earlier had a family vacation up there. And it was interesting. The, I meet the, the, the uh, admissions director at Boston College and he asks me, where are you from? And I said, Dallas, Texas. He goes, oh, you're in. I said, I said, what? He goes, we haven't, we ha this is 1979. He goes, we have no students from Texas so far. Uh, and I, you know, I was looking at, a, I was looking at a place in Texas, uh, at SMU, and I really wasn't as focused. And I think today, having been involved in alumni admissions, as long as I have, kids are very focused about, I'm applying to two, four, six schools. In, in 1980, it just wasn't top of mind for a lot of kids. And I knew kids that would literally graduate from high school and then start looking. So it's much more organized today than what you would have found then. It was like, oh, yeah, I'm going to college. But it wasn't something that was um, omnipresent in terms of your, of your senior year of high school. But uh, uh, that was in November. I applied uh, in December, got the, the note in April, and uh, that was it. Um, could you give your high school a shout out, please? Sure. Uh, Jesuit College Prep in Dallas. Okay. And the reason why I want, I want it to be understood for us on this program like you're you're in the Georgetown Hall of Fame. You're in the Georgetown Sports Hall of Fame because again, I, I, if you if you take away anything from this episode, it's just how invaluable you are as a resource. And the fact again, I, I, the fact that I'm able to share that in a way that you know um, offers the con offers more to the conversation. Um, just just the other day, we had uh, there was a Reggie Williams post, and in the post. Uh, um, it showed Reggie um, obviously dunking a ball, mm -hmm. but showed him making a deflection on defense, getting a steal, making a deflection on defense. So I immediately go to Georgetown History Project and I pull up Reggie's career, you know, the career rebounds, mm -hmm. career, Reggie's six in career rebounds and six in steals. So that wasn't an anomaly, right? So mm -hmm. it's the ability to, to share those facts. Right. So your your facts, sir. We really and, what, and, and that's appreciated. It also it plays to the fact that and for whatever reason, I, I don't know the, the backstory on this. A lot of that information was not kept by Georgetown over the years. So aside from the press guides they would have in a corner in the SID office, they did not keep a lot of this information. In fact, it wasn't until I started to really review this and then send some information back to the sports information directors at the time. They didn't have a complete list of all the players that had played there. And so a lot of that had just been tribal knowledge. And they said, well, we kind of know what, what happened in the seventies, but they didn't really connect the dots as well. And I think the opportunity to kind of collect all this, put it in a place where someone can look it up, whether that be yourself or a fan or somebody that's doing some research on a player is a, is a nice resource to have. And it allows them to make the decision whether they think this player is better than another, but there was just no central source for it. And this is an opportunity. I think that the website and it's um, and the book tangentially uh, allows people to do. What is uh, your working staff like, John? I am the working staff, uh, <laughs> with the exception of two articles on the, the website. One was submitted about 15 years ago about their favorite players of the, of the Thompson era. 
Another article was posted about their experiences for the Duke game in 2006. Everything else I've written. Um, and it started out, the writing started out around the stats. Around 2007, I said, hey, what if I do a small biography of the top 100 players? This was part of that 2006-2007 centennial season. So over the course of 100 days, I had a different bio for every player. And so I had 100. And then around, around 2012, I had an idea, which it really cost me in the long run, which is, okay, I did 100. Why not have a bio for every former player? And thus began about a three and a half year effort to find information about every past and present player from 1907 to today. Some of which was an enormous, enormous amount of going through newspaper files and things online and date of births, uh, websites, et cetera, et cetera, to find these people. But now that in, within that site, uh, there is a place for every former player, the ones you know, and the ones you don't know. Even more, that, which are more important. Well, here's, a, here's an example of this, because it's one that I, I looked at a couple of days ago. We all know about Reggie Williams. We know about Otto Porter. We know about Eric Floyd. And I was looking up one for a gentleman by the name of Pete Baker. You don't know the name. He played one year in 1946, four points a game. Nothing in the yearbooks, nothing in the news in the Hoya, nothing in the Washington Post says anything special about this man. And then you do a little bit of research and you find out that Pete Baker, who went to, it was six, six, four and two ten, played in Passaic high school after his first year at Georgetown joins the army in world war II. He is on the, among the group that, that leads into the invasion to the, uh, to D-Day in France. And he spends his first six months in occupied in allied occupied France in January of 1945, his company is overrun in the battle of the bulge. And he is, he is captured by the Germans. He spends four and a half months as a prisoner of war. I remember I mentioned about him 6'4", 210. When he gets out, he's 150 pounds. In four and a half months, he wow. lost 55 pounds. Wow. He spends five months in a rehabilitation hospital and comes back to the United States. What does he do? He goes back to Georgetown and plays basketball and graduates in 1947. He died just about four or five years ago at 94, 95. But those are the stories you never read about in a, in a, you know, in a clipping in the yearbook. But yet these people have had ties to the university over the years um, that I think is, is, a, is a good story to tell. And even if you never know about him, never read about him, there's a place for him and his family to say, hey, yes, he did. He was part of Georgetown basketball. And it was something I found over the years. And there's a, an, a, a, a video uh, of him about 10 years ago talking about his experience in World War II and how his, his company survived in the, and if you read about the Battle of the Bulge, you know, it was really difficult in the winter of 45 and the number of casualties that were suffered. And here's a man that after all that comes back to college, finishes his degree and plays varsity basketball. So those are the stories that are also hidden in the site for those who want to know. And if they don't, it's okay. And if they, all they're looking for is to find out, Hey, who was on that final four team? That's okay too. Markham, are we thinking yeah. the same thing over there, Markham? I'm, I'm probably not thinking what you're thinking, but because <laughs> because I because I just want to go back to that clip just very briefly. You're talking about Reggie and that great dunk. Uh, to get to that dunk, there was a great pass from a guy by the name of Bobby Winston mm -hmm. who was celebrating his anniversary today. Just want to give my main man Bobby Winston a shout out. So what what, what were you thinking, Gene? I'm, I, I want to hear. <laughs> so what I was thinking was. You know, in this day and age of everybody has a podcast or everybody has a Zoom or something, this guy with his wealth of knowledge and his wealth of storytelling, you know, I, I like to talk to him offline and see if we can't get him to tell a story in episode. I mean, because <laughs> to, to his point, some, some of this is pretty, pretty powerful stuff because I don't think I would have known about Georgetown going to the NCAA final in 1943, had we not gone in 84, because nobody would have talked about mm -hmm. it. Yeah. And, so, and, that, and that team was made up mostly of freshmen and sophomores because of the war effort everybody had left. So you had literally 17 and 18-year-olds that were playing for Georgetown. The backstory to that was, and it's a little bit, I won't go into great detail, but a number of them had gone to elementary school together. And their A, not only called AAU, but their coach at junior high school level later became the head coach at Georgetown, Elmer Ripley. He brings them to Georgetown. They know his system left and right. So by the time they get to college, it's not just 
17 and 18 year old learning college basketball. They had been playing his style of basketball for seven years. And wow, you know, they went 22 and four until the uh, NCAA final there against Wyoming. That sounds kind of familiar. Some coach <laughs> bringing players with him from high school. <laughs> and that's how it works. H heard that somewhere. <laughs> uh, so since, since, I mean, I, I have to say that I, I, I think it's pretty clear that you would be the go-to person uh, for Georgetown. We're thinking basketball. the same thing, Mark. Now we're thinking the same thing. Um, Gene hates this, and I don't care. Not today. Do. Not today, Mark. I, I want to know who your – well, I, I want to know who your all-time Hoya starting five is by position, and I'm just going to say beforehand, mm -hmm. I'm pretty sure – your starting five will be much better than that of the president of the Hoya Hoop Club, <laughs> one Mark Guerrero. I'm 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 just walking out on a okay. limb and saying that. Uh because John, John, he, he had he had David Wingate <laughs> as his starting four. Uh I'm just gonna guess that you won't have David Wingate there. But yeah. after you give me your starting five, I want you to fill out the roster. If uh, okay. for a team going to twelve, this okay. is this is easy for John. See, so let me give let, let me give you the twelve. Let me give you the twelve first, and then we can talk about the starting. John, part. feel feel okay. free to elaborate or tell a story or two. Feel just free, brief, just briefly. Okay, four guards, four forwards, four centers, and we'll talk about our um, two centers. We'll talk about the other two in a minute. So your four guards. I'm going to start out with a name that doesn't get as much attention uh, from the recent history, which is Derek Jackson. Played from 74 to 78. Before my time, Gene might have seen him if he went to a couple of games at McDonough along the years. 49% uh, from the field, uh, 15 points a game. John Thompson once had a quote for him and said that he was the most, the, the, um, I'm trying to think of the exact quote. So, um, oh, here it is. I, I wrote it down. This is from John Thompson. Derek Jackson is the finest all around person that I have ever coached at Georgetown. By the way, Big John didn't just give out those kind of compliments. Derek Jackson was, was the star of that 75 team that went to the NCAA tournament for the first time. Were it not for a late season illness, the senior, they'd probably go back and they went to the NIT instead. He's now a minister in Illinois, um, a, really a top player for his time. He only played in 109 games, but 15 points a game for a guard is not to be ignored in those days. Your other guards, John Duran, um, top of the line for what he did for Georgetown in joining the Big East Conference. Eric Floyd. I don't think people realize how good a shooter he was, almost 50% from the field, uh, 2,300 points. Uh, if there was a three-point line, forget it. And Allen Iverson, because it's Allen Iverson. He wasn't going to play four years. If he did, he'd probably have about 3,300 points in his career. But uh, he changed the game in terms of how that position is played. So there's your four guards. Um, forwards, one more from, from, the, from the past, and then we'll get into some modern players. Uh, Jim Barry was a forward at Georgetown from 1962 to 66. In his sophomore season, he averages 22 points a game and is named an All-American. Um, averages to almost 20 points as a junior before his knee blows out. Um, he was a, a forward that could really do a lot of different things. He had 47% um, from the field. He's a 90% foul shooter. He was only 6'7", but he could play multiple positions. Uh, he was probably the best of the pre-72 players. Uh, Reggie Williams. I, I don't think people say enough about how good Reggie Williams was, especially in that 1986-87 season. Mm. He carried that team. I, I will say that this is something of a – Georgetown does not do a good job of honoring those be, below the Hall of Fame. And I think Big John had a, a bias Absolutely towards those right who were in the top. He had the bias towards those in the Hall of Fame. If Reggie Williams was playing for the Celtics or the, the Pistons instead of the New Jersey Nets and the Denver Nuggets – I think we would think a lot more about his NBA career, but put that aside, his college career was outstanding. I, I know that he is certainly capable of that. Your other two forwards, Mike Sweetney, especially his play as in the Big East as, as a junior, he was at 25 points a game in the Big East in 2003. He had a game with, against Syracuse where he had 32 and 16. For his time, he was the best power forward of that, that, that era for Georgetown. The other one I'd say, and I picked him above Otto Porter, which was Jeff Green, and what he meant to that program in a, a four years of tremendous growth from, oh, well, three years from 04 to 07. 
and his work in getting Georgetown, not just through the Big East tournament in 07, where you had to have a big game to beat Notre Dame, but his efforts against Vanderbilt and North Carolina to get to the Final Four, those are, the, those are my, two, my four forwards. Uh, centers, I only had two because, frankly, when these two guys get on the court, they're not giving up spot for a third, <laughs> which is Patrick Ewing and Alonzo Mourning. They're going to take, take the time. So there's 10. And I wrote down two other names, which I feel are not going to be starters. So they're not in that, that, ear, that um, tier, but they're important because Georgetown always had those guys on the bench, those guys that would provide two or three minutes of spark that would be there to not only support their team, but to give them the boost they need at the critical time. And I know Markham doesn't want to hear this, but the two on the bench is Jonathan Wallace and Gene Smith. I saw, I mean, I saw them both play in ways that Gene didn't get to start a lot of times. When he got on the court, I, there's a game that he might remember. It's, it's February of 81 at McDonough against Villanova. Stuart and Stuart Granger, Granger is, the, is, is the star of Villanova, and Gene is, is remarkable. Stuart Granger did not score a point in that game. And the crowd is just stunned. Here's a freshman just sticking with them. You need that. And yes, you're not going to get 30 minutes off out of this lineup with Gene Smith or John Wallace. John Wallace hits that point, that three-pointer to put Georgetown in overtime against North Carolina, Carolina. in the um, 07 regional final. His, his role was limited, but when, it, when he was out there, he was very effective. Mm-hmm. You need a couple of those guys on the bench. Kenny Smith still owes me dinner over that game. Hasn't yeah. paid up. And uh, uh, but, but, but I will say this, John. Uh, the reason I ask guys for their 12 mm-hmm. uh, is because I actually do want Gene to get on the team. Uh, I'm, <laughs> I'm, I'm not mad about that. I mean, I, I think he's very deserving uh, being on the team. Uh, we do need a guy who can come in uh, and play defense. And you don't have to worry about the offense. You know, we got four guys who can score, and he's not concerned about that because he knows that's not his forte. He knows his lane. I but, just want to know where the, where the knuckleball theory came from. <laughs> a knuckleball. My jump shot was a knuckleball. <laughs> but, but I think that those kinds of players fit well with what Georgetown had been over the years. And with the exception of, like I said, there's, there's really only one pre-1972. But as, as I've, I've been watching it, like I said, since 1980, you will see the kind of hills and valleys of Georgetown, but they all stressed the ability to maximize the time they had on the floor. And these were not guys that uh, were st- stat stuffers. They were very efficient players. So a player like Jeff Green is very efficient in what he does then and what he does now. A player like uh, John Duran was remarkably efficient. I-, I found a number for him. I, I kind of looked at it. I go, is this true? In his senior season, 1980, he had seven assists a game. And the only player that's been close to that ever since was Kenny Bruner for his, in his brief 12 game appearance before he skipped out on an airplane to Fresno state. John was a, you know, a very efficient player. These are all players that I think are very efficient and would play well as a team and not just be individuals say, are right, these are the, the top seven scores of all time, or these are the top seven single game appearances of all time. It's, it's more of a team in that effort. So, so John, we want to stay on this, on this, on this role here. So, so Gene, Gene, he he gave you his twelve. He didn't, he didn't, he didn't. He's not finished. He he's going to tell you. He's going to tell you starting five now. Oh, I thought. Oh, okay, I thought we could just pick from that ten. No, no, no. no. <laughs> he he gives you that. All my right. Bad, bad. <laughs> I'm going to say Floyd and Iverson as the guards, but I know that they they point guard was kind of a different situation between those two. So Floyd and Iverson. I would say Reggie. I would say a slight nod to Jeff Green and Ewing as the center. Iverson, Floyd, Ewing, Reggie. So you don't really have a four there either. Yes. I would say Jeff is a three. Well, but he was playing a four at that time. Yeah. Because, you, you know, you didn't have that among you. You had guys like, you had Daryl Owens at the three. You had other guys because you, you you, they ran Hibbert for the most part at the five. So Green kind of fit. In between, although, yes, Jeff was playing center for a number of those early games while Roy was still kind of getting his feet wet in the, in the lineups. But that's, that's tangentially where it is. You could put Sweetney at the four. Um, it's, a, it's a pretty close call. So Mark- Jeff Green, Sleepy Allen, Patrick. Yes. Mark- and, who, who is, and who is? Reggie. Who, and what? So Eric Floyd, Allen Iverson, Reggie Williams. I'm, 
I'm, I'm just looking at I'm trying huh. to figure out who's making the Gatorade for that team. <laughs> I'm kidding. <laughs> <laughs> so, John, John, just staying with that theme, we want to kind of pick your brain or hear from you, your top for your basketball seasons, mm -hmm. uh, players, and moments. Because, again, you having this, this wealth of in intel, it's not going to be your obvious. Mm -hmm. So just – if you could share with us. And I'm going to say that this is based on things I've seen. It's not fair for me to say something happened in the past that I never viewed or I, I read about it. It's, it's immaterial. So um, my top season is 1981-82. So my, our sophomore year. It is a season. I'll spend a couple minutes on this. I don't want to go into more, more detail that's necessary. It's a season of highs and lows. It opens up in Anchorage, Alaska at the Great Alaska Shootout. I don't know if they let you go. I know you were injured for the first part of that season. They lose to Southwest Louisiana. They lose to Ohio State. They almost get beat by Alaska Anchorage, who out-rebounds them with Patrick Ewing, 47 to 35. So they start out wow. one and two, and they're struggling. They win their next 11, including a game at Madison Square Garden, the first time I ever went to the Garden, against St. John's, where we led 41 to nine in the first half. So this team wow. was rolling. Then they lose three in a row including a game at, at the Providence Civic Center against Providence, who won two Big East games the entire year, and they beat Georgetown. So all of a sudden, it's three losses in a row. And then it starts to rebuild. Georgetown beat Villanova uh, two times within a week. Villanova was the best team in the conference that year. Villanova lost three games in 82 in the conference, and two of them were to Georgetown. And thus began this, this climb. And we get to mid-February, um, they played number four, Missouri, a magical game. And I don't think Mark, I mean, Gene can say, speak to this. How loud was that gym wow. at 11 a.m. on a Saturday morning? Wow. Is that Steve Stepanovich? Yes, Steve. it is. John Sunvolt. Uh, Ricky Frazier. There's a, there's a tremendous story, and it's, in the, it's on the website if anyone wants to read it, about how that game gets scheduled. And I think people have heard the, the early story about the fact that Frank Rienzo says Cap Center is not available but we have this place called McDonough Arena. Forget that it's a gym. McDonough Arena we can play in, and, and my, Missouri signs up for it, having never seen the building before. But that's not even half the story. It turns out that the athletic director at Missouri is a gentleman by the name of Dave Hart, who used to come from Louisville. He was so insistent that Missouri get on national television, and Missouri was a great team that did. They, had, they were three-time Big, e, Big Eight champions. He was so insistent to get Missouri on television, that he reorganized the schedule for Norm Stewart. They played four games in a week. They played at home against Iowa State. They played, uh, they were on the road against Oklahoma State, I should say, on a Saturday. They're at home against Iowa State on a Tuesday. They traveled to Norman, Oklahoma to play Oklahoma on a Thursday night. Get home, get on a flight, fly to D.C. by Friday night for a Saturday game at Georgetown. They never see the building before they walk in the door at 10 a.m. on that Saturday morning because the flight was delayed. There's traffic on the GW Parkway. And Norm Stewart says, look, you guys have played three games in six days. It's a night on the town. You, we're not going to practice. We'll just get there a couple hours before the game and we'll be ready to go. And they walk into McDonough Gym that morning with 5,000 students, some of which were, may have been inebriated at the time. <laughs> and they never, they never recovered. And, it, and that game was like gasoline on a fire. It set Georgetown flying through the, through the rest of the Big East, sweeps the Big East tournament. They go into Wyoming, and they beat up on Bill Garnett. They go to Fresno State up in, in Utah. And then the game people forget before the Final Four was out at the Marriott Center. They're playing number four ranked and number one seed, Oregon State. Mm -hmm. And George, well, it's one of the single best games of the Thompson era. Georgetown destroyed Oregon State by 24 and people don't realize how good a team that was until they saw what Georgetown did to them. And again, from the time that uh, they, that Missouri game, Georgetown did not lose another game until the final 16 seconds against North Carolina. Well, so Gene that's my favorite season. He always says the 82 team was better than 84 team. He always says that. It was deeper. I, I, think, I, that's, I think I would say that. It had the, the mix of youth. It had, you know, because this was a five-man freshman team. And including Anthony Jones, who's somewhat forgotten now, but he had Ewing, Jones, Martin as a real core of the freshmen. But you had five seniors. You had Eric Floyd. You had Eric Smith. You had Hancock. You had Spriggs. You had Blaylock. So you had experience on both sides of the equation. 
and they were a tremendous defensive team. They held opponents to 53 points a game score. And they, they were shooting 50%. So you just knew the math that a, a team could not score enough in most cases to beat them. So 82 so, was my favorite team. So, so let me ask you this about the, the 82 and 84 team, because when Gene says that, I say, I hear, and he says what you just said, mm -hmm. man, we were so deep. We were this blah, blah, blah. And I say, yeah, I agree with all. But in 84, you had a junior Patrick Ewing mm -hmm. and those freshmen you just talked about. I, 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 I see you, those three freshmen, and I raise you a guy named Reggie Williams. Mm -hmm. <laughs> who, if, if I'm not mistaken, was the MVP of the national championship game. Correct. Correct. So do you, if those teams were to play each other, who do you think wins? I think it's game of tempo. I, you know, I think that one of the things the 82 team did very well is controlled. And remember, this is a, a time where Georgetown was not expected to win. The expectation levels had been had markedly changed after 82. And all of a sudden, Georgetown is no longer the, the, the hunter, but the hunted. Um, right. I think that that's just a matter of tempo because that 84 team has, has Williams, it has Graham, it has players. 82 team had more experience. So they had a guy like a Mike Hancock that's not going to get you 20 points a game, but knew how to play in, in certain situations. They had Ed Spriggs that could really spell Ewing from, you know, appropriately. It would just have to be a combination of what kind of game that they would play. And the same argument it also applies to the 85 team. They said 85 team's got so much going for it, but it was a matter of tempo. Uh, that game in Rupp Arena with Villanova, it was as much about tempo as it was about talent. And Villanova was able to ad take advantage of that. And one of the reasons, I will say this, because it's one of those things I've read about over the years that people claim that Villanova was the greatest upsets of all time. And it wasn't. In, in January of 85, Georgetown plays Villanova at Cap Center. Villanova lost by two. They go out to Philadelphia. They lost by six. The, Raleigh and the Villanova had played Georgetown like eight times in, in over three years. They'd beaten, they'd beaten Georgetown the year before at Capitol Center in double overtime. Mm -hmm. They understood Georgetown. And that game only takes place because of familiarity. If Villanova had not got to the finals, there was a scenario where Oklahoma, Oklahoma lost in the regional final to Memphis by two points with Wayman Tisdale, one of the greatest college players of that era, who was within a week of signing with Georgetown. That's a different story. But um, had Oklahoma got beaten Memphis, Oklahoma would have run over Villanova. And that would have been a Georgetown-Oklahoma final and not a Georgetown-Villanova final. The familiarity, when you get a team that knows them as well as they do, just like Providence in 87, Rick Pitino, New Georgetown, back and forth. That's a tougher assignment than to play a team for the first time where it's just talent. So Villanova had a great year in 85, but don't be fooled that Raleigh didn't know Georgetown as well as any coach that would have ever played him that year. So you just mentioned a name, uh, and, and you said this, you, Wayman Tisdale. Mm -hmm. I want to hear your version of this story, and then I'm going to tell a Okay. A, a Wayman Tisdale story that will blow your mind. So I don't, I don't think you would blow your mind, but I, I'm waiting. I'm okay. waiting. I'm, I'm going to take a sip of my, my beverage over here. You do <laughs> Wayman Tisdale is a 6'9 power forward out of uh, Booker T. Washington High School in Tulsa and is relatively quickly announced as the greatest player to come out of Oklahoma uh, in 20 years. Um, he is looking at two schools. Uh, he's looking at Oklahoma because Billy Tubbs has just offered his father a job and has just offered his, his older brother his college scholarship for basketball. And he's looking at Georgetown. It's right after the finals in 82. Tisdale announces he's going to take a visit to Georgetown. Three days later, he announces, I'm going to Oklahoma. But he left the caveat to say, if I had gone to Georgetown, I would have signed. And Billy Tubbs went as far as to reschedule Oklahoma's basketball practices so that the Tisdale brothers could go to church on Sunday night. He arranged with uh, a local alumni to bring chicken dinners over to the Tisdale's dorms so that they were never hungry on, after practice. He threw figurative and literally everything he had to make sure that Wayman Tisdale stayed in Oklahoma. Um, but it was, and I always think about this, and Tisdale had a great college career, 25 points a game. He was the number two draft pick in the, in the 85 draft. Were it not for... David Stern picking the or it wasn't it was Stern yeah picking New York as the number one pick. 
Patrick Ewing could have been in Indiana and Wayman Tisdale could have been in New York if those cards had flipped. But imagine a line in 83, a front line in 83, 84, which is Reggie Williams, Wayman Tisdale, and Patrick Ewing. Man. So that's one that got away. Uh, there's, a, there's a feature on the website that talks about former, that players that played elsewhere that could have been, gone to Georgetown and what, would their, what their impact would be. Because there's some we know, Grant Hill and the Kenny Anderson stories. But if Wayman Tisdale had gone to Georgetown for three years, Chris Jackson, um, hey, I'll go way even back before that. Mark Elgin, Macon. Elgin Baylor Elgin was looking Randy. at Georgetown. Wow. They turned him away. At the, they turned him away at the gates because Georgetown basically was segregated in 1954, and he goes off to um, West Coast and Seattle, and incredible numbers at Seattle uh, over two years uh, as a as a college player. John Thompson was recruited at least at the beginning by Georgetown and pushed away for the same reason. Uh, and then Red Auerbach says, "Wait a minute! If you go to Providence, I've got territorial rights uh, of New England colleges." You could play at this with the Celtics if you'd come to Providence. But there were a lot of players that Georgetown had an opportunity to bring in over the years, those names you mentioned. Even more recently, somebody like a Paul George had looked very carefully at Georgetown, but Georgetown had recruited so many players that he thought he couldn't play. So he goes off to, in Fresno State for two years and then goes in the NBA. Uh, a lot of people wanted to come to Georgetown in that 1980 to 2005 kind of period. So, so John, I just want to jump in here because I, I see Markham burning over there. He's loving, <laughs> he's loving this way more, way more than me. As much as I'm loving it, he's loving it two times. Okay. Um, do you think those type stories make Georgetown that much more interesting, that much more special? Um, or do you think it um, challenges it even that much? You know, for me, knowing what I know, obviously mm -hmm. having played there, um, I think the way that we do business, even though I might, we might agree to disagree, it just makes the unit, because Georgetown wasn't set up to be a basketball powerhouse. So I just think that these type stories, again, if we, the more we can share them, I think it just proves how special we are and how unique we are. I think the word is unique. Uh, it was never meant to be that, that it was not Duke wasn't meant to be Carolina either, but it was never meant to be North Carolina or Kentucky or UCLA. It was a confluence of things that happened. Uh, that got Georgetown to where it was. Um, and then when you see players of significance that start to be attracted to, growing up, I'm sure Wayman Tisdale never heard the word Georgetown until he was in high school. And he heard it through what he saw on television or what he read about and said, hey, this may be a place for me. And knowing what you both know, since you went through the program, you know how sports and in general and Georgetown specific can be life-changing. And you wonder how these lives change if, they don't, if they, they decided to go to Georgetown, whether they were successful or not, how they would have changed, how Georgetown would have changed. And I use the example of, of Baylor. What is Georgetown different as an institution if they see Elgin Baylor as a, as a fellow college student and as a basketball player? You know, Georgetown didn't bring in an African-American in the college until 1962. And it's something that it, it seems bizarre in, in retrospect, but Georgetown was very hesitant to bring in anyone that was not they, they were not familiar with. What does it mean to the university if that door had been opened 10 years earlier? So yes, I think the unique as, aspect of it is it's kind of fun to think about what it would be like any more than if you were at North Carolina, Patrick Ewing's runner-up school was North Carolina. So what does that lineup look like in 82 with Worthy, Perkins, and Ewing? So yes, there's a lot of what if, but I think the fact that Georgetown is unique enough that it has attracted a variety of people over the years that you wonder, okay, yes, they had success elsewhere, but they could have added even more to the, to the story that Georgetown basketball has become. So I got to say, everything you said about Wayman Tisdale is absolutely true. Uh, so there's a guy named Marcus Miller, who is the preeminent base, base player in the world. After Wayman hmm. uh, stopped playing basketball, he became a very, very correct base player. And I met Marcus at the gym we used to go to, and we've been playing. That, that, that's another great story I won't get into, but he, and he became kind of Wayman's mentor. So he brought Wayman up to the gym one day, and me and Wayman had next. We we're going to be on the same team. While we we're waiting, we start talking about some of the things you were talking about, and I, I, I didn't know he was 
almost at Georgetown. He was like, yeah, man, but I'm going to be honest with you, man. Like, I mean, Georgetown looked good, but they, they made it impossible for me to leave <laughs> Oklahoma. And he winked at me. So well, you take make what you want of that. Well, wink. there's there's a story about that too. That uh, it was discovered a couple of years later in the Daily Oklahoman, which is the paper up there, that there was an age sports agent in Oklahoma City who was going bankrupt. And as part of the, the bankruptcy proceedings, there apparently were checks written to a Mr. W. L. Tisdale, and everybody's like, "What well, is this, Wayman?" And it turns out that Wayman, his brother, and his father all share the same initials. So each of them go, "Wasn't me," and so. <laughs> And we're, here's where it gets funny. So this sports agent, it, it, they, they kind of settle it, no problems with OU basketball or anything like that. But the sports agent's wife was the personal secretary of Billy Tubbs, the head coach. <laughs> but that's how Oklahoma ran in those days. This was peak hey. Barry Switzer. This was, you know, the run and gun 80s. Um, but I, I get the sense that Oklahoma was going to do anything they could to make sure that he stayed there. And he had a great career. Uh, with yeah, with the Sooners, uh, could, should have been a better NBA career, and obviously a tragic end to his life. But um, yeah. uh, what a uh, tremendous athlete! John, so, end it, hold, hold on, just real quick. The end of this, the end of this Wayman Tisdale story. Okay. So we have next, uh, but then a guy on the winning team quits. So now we're going to be split <laughs> up, and. The people who watch this show know I talk about how my how devastating my post game is, and so now instead of being on the same team, Wayman is guarding me. We have ball first. He is not second round second pick overall. Wayman Tisdale. He's put on about forty pounds, uh, and we've just been talking. We're kind of friendly, so I go down to the left block where I always start the game off about to post up and we're about to take the ball in. Wayman goes, Hey, wait, 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 hold on. Hold on. Wait a minute. He picks me up literally like a Barbie doll <laughs> and places me behind the three point line. <laughs> That's where you belong. Young fella. The gym felt like I li it was like a baby. Like he lifted and I, I listened to him. And I ran him to death and we won. Just want you to know. Yeah. But it, it was, it, people fell out laughing. Like it was like nothing. John, I wanted, to, I wanted to go back to, thank you for the story, Malcolm. Always good stories. Um, especially you on the block. Always good stories. <laughs> um, you said the first black player did not get to Georgetown until 62? No, the first African-American student did not get in until 62. A year before, they tested it by bringing in African nationals. So they had a couple students that were in the pre-med program from Ghana, I think it was. And then 62 comes the first undergraduate. The first basketball player was Bernard White in the uh, fall of 65. Okay. And he plays two and a half years before he leaves the team and decides to just finish his degree. Um, I, I, there's a story on the website to talk about how basketball's integration helped build out that that conversation within the university. And I had an opportunity to talk on a Zoom call. Mr. White had died in 2014. Of, of, and, um, but the second player that had come through was a gentleman by the name of Mark Edwards, mm -hmm. uh, class of 73. Um, he'd gone into Matha. Um, actually, he tells a story. He grew up in Georgetown. He went to Holy Trinity School right there on 36th Street for elementary school. And then his family moves up to, to a PG or to not PG to uh, near Hyattsville. Yeah, I guess it was PG. And they go to, they go to the math. He gets an offer to go to, to Texas and to Georgetown. His, his mother says, Texas too far. So he comes to Georgetown. He's the second African-American player plays um, two years for Jack McGee. Who's the coach. And then John Thompson comes in. John was probably a little suspicious of the math of people at that time. But he did play for a year. <laughs> and he's got a really fascinating story about how he sees basketball as an opportunity to build out the discussion with regards to how Georgetown looked at students of color in the university. If you ever have a chance to, to bring him on as a guest, it'd be really a good opportunity because he spoke with real uh, candor and passion about what he saw in those late 60s and how he saw the efforts of Charlie Deacon and John Thompson and Father Henley to say, this is important to us, not only 
from an academic perspective, but from where we, our role is within the city. Mm -hmm. And he had a first hand view of it. And he could speak to what Bernard White went through, which was less about the fact that he was African American and less and more about the fact that the coaches didn't really see a role for him. And he spent a lot of time just kind of waiting for his opportunity to, uh, to succeed. Bernard White was the president of his high school class. He was a National Honor Society. He you know, hit, hit all the grades, mm -hmm. but the coaches really didn't see a role for him. And he spent literally two and a half years sitting on a bench. And I'm sure for any athlete, that's frustrating. Yeah, yeah. Markham? Man, um, you talked about uh, the 82 season as being uh, your, your favorite. What would you say is your most disappointing season? Good question, good question. Well, I guess the question is disappointing in the regular season or disappointing in the, in the finale, I guess is the better way of saying it. Uh, there were a couple of years where I thought Georgetown in the, in the late John Thompson, JT three years could have been more successful than when it was. And the two, I mean, again, it's not a case of this is a bad season or anything of that nature. Uh, 2013, 14, the year after Otto Porter, you know, they go from number five in the country to they lose to DePaul in the Big East, in the Big East tournament uh, and then end up in the NIT. That was, there was a level of disappointment there because you still had players. It wasn't think, people had not kind of skipped out yet. You still had Markel Starks. You still had Nate Lubick. You had Hopkins. You had uh, first year DSR or second year DSR. Uh, so there was talent there. It's less to say about disappointment, but more about where they were opportunity wise. And I think as a, I'm speaking as a fan and less about history that, you know, there's definite hills and valleys for where Georgetown has gone in basketball. And you could also make the point that when they were on the top, they didn't take full advantage of it. 89, 90. God, those were good years. In 90, that, you, you may remember in the 90 season, um, Phil, uh, um, oh, I can't first name, uh, Hoops Weiss from the New York Daily News picked Georgetown as his number one team entering that season. And the, had the ACC Big East Challenge game with North Carolina. And 90 team had a lot to offer. And yet it hit the wrong, it just it was the wrong connection at, in the tournament, in the Big East tournament, they didn't go where they needed to go. And uh, the NCAs flattened out 91. And there were some injuries involved. Matumbo had this great game, but they didn't make it through the Big East. They had, their, they had UNLV in the second round game. Those are disappointments of another kind because the opportunity to excel was held short. It's not so much you have a bad team, but when you have a great team and you can't make it through the, the gauntlet, there's a certain amount of disappointment involved with that. I think oh, Alonzo oh, Mourning oh, oh. sat on the side for about 12 minutes trying to get in that game in the first half. Like I, I, I replayed in my mind many times what would have happened if I accidentally spilled some Gatorade on the floor and they had to stop the game. Yeah. Uh, but I asked that question. Uh, it was interesting that you went down that path because for me, uh, in terms of what could have happened and should have happened, it's the 89 season. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I, don't, I, don't, I don't really, I didn't feel like we had a beast of a team in 90 as compared to 89, because we had, we had uh, that, that senior class in 89, mm -hmm. with Charles Smith, Jonathan Edwards, Bobby Winston and Jaron Jackson. Uh, it, 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 was, it was really amazing. And we had, Alonzo as a freshman uh, and the whole year, whenever Alonzo got in foul trouble, the Kimbe wasn't wagging a finger then, but he was a solid, you, you talked about how Spriggs mm -hmm. was able to back up Ewing. Uh, he, he, he came in and backed up Zoe. And for whatever reason, I'll never understand it. John didn't play him. Uh, he only played two minutes that game. And I, I think that game, and, and by the way, th that year, people always talk about the Princeton game. Mm -hmm. If we don't play Princeton, if we play Jackson State or whoever in the first mm -hmm. round, I think we win the title. Yeah. Because playing Princeton, and we had gone through the Big East tournament like a hot knife through butter. Like the Syracuse championship game, uh, I'm mad today that he didn't let me and Raheem Bell play. <laughs> <laughs> because we were, I mean, we were killing. And... Uh, uh, we were on such a high 
And then when we played Princeton and almost lost in the whole, like that was like the David versus Goliath. The whole world was rooting against us in Providence. And that game kind of knocked us off of that high. Like, oh, maybe we could lose. And it, it just something about the dynamic changed. And, 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 and no one ever talks about that 89 team no. because we didn't win anything. And I, we were fabulous. And I agree with that. The second one that comes to mind, because sometimes people ask me, like, what's the worst loss? And, you know, every, every loss is different, but there's one that sticks out, and it's not what you think. It's not Villanova. It's not North Carolina. It's the 96 Big East final against Connecticut. Mm -hmm. We were rolling through that tournament. John, John's up, uh, Thompson's up 13 points in about four minutes ago and stall, puts, starts stalling the ball, and UConn just climbs back in, climbs back in, and wins it on that uh, tip-in with like seven seconds to go. Here's, what, here's the what if about that. If Georgetown wins that game, they're number one seed and they're not playing UMass. And they roll through that tournament. And that tournament, the 96 team, the 96 Final Four wasn't that strong. It ended with Kentucky. But that team could have gone to the Final Four. But the fact they get a number two seed and get slotted in with UMass, a really good team with Marcus Camby, derailed them for the Final Four. And much like 89, it was all about the scheduling in, in the tournament. And again, they're playing anybody else. They go through those first two weeks, and they, they're, they're in the regional finals, and it does, there's no Princeton in the round of 16. Yeah. But that's, those are kind of teams where you say they could have done much better had the situation provided itself. But the great teams beat regardless. Two things I have for the, the, that dialogue you two just had. Um, John, you said fan historian. Mm -hmm. Said those is, is two different two yeah. different things. How how do you separate? When do they collide? When does one take over the other? And then the base of that question is, what's your most favorite part of the Georgetown History Project? Okay, I think when I when I'm writing on that side of the of the, of the equation, the website from the history side, I try to take a longer view of it. So yes, I can get frustrated as a fan about what happened last season. But I got to write to it in the sense of, okay, it's not so much about how we did, but the fact they lost 21 games is the more historical piece of the puzzle. So I try to take what's in the history side of the equation and leave that to a longer view. Whereas if I'm speaking, if I'm on a message board or something like that, I can speak to more of kind of the, the here and now. Um, as to the favorite part of the website, I, I, I've been, I like the idea of the player bios. I love the idea of the stats. You can look up anything. One of the things that I've done lately that has been most interesting for me is some of the long-term feature stories that I've done. So over the course of the last seven or eight years, we've added in things such as the history of the Big East Conference, the story about the players that got away, the story about uh, the 1972 team. There's a recent story that's out there, and I posted it out this summer with regards to the, uh, the 25th year of Capital One Arena. And not only for its significance to basketball, but its significance to the Washington, D.C. community and how that decision by a Poland to basically put everything he had on the table to build that arena, not only change basketball in DC, but change DC itself, that the green line and the commerce, the, the nightlife, the restaurants, the hotels, the, the, the construction around the green line has fundamentally changed Washington DC as a whole. So that area from Petworth to the North, all the way down to Navy yard. I, I had a stat that I, I wrote down here. That's just stunning. It said, one out of every two new households in Washington, D.C., under the age of 35, live now along the Green Line. Half of all new retail development in Washington, D.C., new retail development is along the Green Line. This facility, which opened up an area of downtown which wasn't very good and which people didn't really want to be around back in the 80s, has fundamentally changed what D.C. provided. And it allowed people to think of D.C. now as a living downtown. It had collateral effects like gentrification, granted, but the decision to put that arena there has changed DC in ways they never thought was gonna take place. And it opened up the ability for people to see basketball firsthand and not in Prince George's County. But the, the cultural end of Capital One Arena is a fascinating story. Those are things I like to put on the website and see in two, three, five years, if it still holds up. Excellent answer, excellent answer. John, we, we could talk to you all day. Like, I mean, th this, like I say, I say it every, every episode, th 
unbelievable. We're going to continue to invite you back. You're going to have to tell yeah, us. Yeah. This, 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 most definitely, uh, <laughs> I, I hope, uh, and I, I'm, I'm going to pull my Southern card out. I'm from Memphis. You, you, you're, you're a little over there uh, in, in Dallas, low, low, low down the way. Uh, I hope we can get you back for a part two for sure. Uh, what, what you just started talking about, uh, it's mm -hmm. very interesting. I mean, we, we could talk about why the Metro isn't in Georgetown and what that could mean. Uh, I mean, just th there's lots to talk about with uh, John. Uh, and and, and I, I hope we can get you back. Well, I'm very uh, much appreciative for the time great. today. And again, that's part of that's why these shows are interesting. That's why the fact that both of you lead a conversation, which is not just about basketball. It's bigger than basketball. It's about the world we live in and the people we meet along the way. Those are the stories that have elevated Hoya Locker Room to be something more than just another basketball podcast. So as, a, as somebody who watches it regularly, I want you to guys continue the conversations to be able to be that conduit to talk about things more than just, hey, do you remember when we played this game? Well, what was the impact of that game? What was the impact of the people that made it happen? And where does that impact fit us and lead us today and tomorrow? So by all means, thank you for the time, but also continued success in advancing the, the cause forward. Thank, thank you so much, Markham. If you don't have a quote. Oh, absolutely. Dude. I have one. <laughs> Actually, I'm, well, I'm, well, gonna, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna do mine first. Yeah, that, I, I want you to have do one, John. Uh, that usually that's Markham's area, but I just wanna, I wanna leave um, um, our people with this. And I also wanna, you know, I wanna dedicate this to you. Um, history never really says goodbye. History says, see you later. And sir, I, I can't wait till we see you later. Thank you. Thank you. Well, I, for, for, for part two, I, I want to lead in with, uh, you know, there's almost 150 pages in the book. My favorite uh, are page 104 and 106. And we're talking about how you got the, you know, the, the stories about the, the book. I just, let's see, this thing is not cooperating. Go back the other way. Go back the other way. Right there. And, there we go. I'm very curious about that picture. Uh, we don't have to talk about it now. This, this is phony background. Go back, go back this way. Go back that way. <laughs> There, there we go. We, we got the important part. Uh, I, I'm pretty sure that my dad took that picture. Uh, and there's a date on the camera, like the how that. I'm, I'm, mm -hmm. I'm curious about that. We won't talk about that now. We're, we're, that, we're, we'll start off with uh, with part two uh, about that. But I'm very, very appreciative yes. uh, of what you said uh, about us doing the show. Uh, that, that really means uh, a lot. A lot to me because uh, there are people out there uh, who don't understand and recognize the value. Uh, and to that end, I have two quotes. One is uh, from a hockey player. You miss 100% of the shots you don't take. That's Wayne Gretzky. And the other from a baseball player. Never let the fear of striking out get in your way. And that's Babe Ruth. And we're going to keep taking our shots on all your locker room. And if we strike out, we'll be back up to the plate next time, swinging harder and swinging smarter. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, this has been a lot of fun for me. A lot of fun. And I echo that. And to all our fans, enjoy the rest of your summer. To you, John, again, our tremendous gratitude for the work that you do. And you are officially in the Hoya Locker Room Hall of Fame. <laughs> officially. Thank you, sir, sure. for all you do. See you next time. See you. Thanks again. Thank you.